It's 1.30 in the afternoon. Coming up next, Making Contact. Stay tuned. This week on Making Contact. The unions allowed themselves to become partners with the state. It's been decades since the U.S. had a powerful labor movement, and recent efforts to revive it have mostly fallen flat. The Employee Free Choice Act, uh, we should be celebrating its demise. But there is hope for a new labor movement in the United States. It's a vision beyond the unions and includes everyone from steel workers to undocumented house cleaners. On this edition, a discussion on the future of labor in the U.S., moderated by Francis Fox Piven and recorded at the 2010 Left Forum in New York City. It includes some inspiring stories of organizing workers on the Gulf Coast. I'm Andrew Stelzer, and this is Making Contact, a program connecting people, vital ideas, and important information. Uh, I think all of us, at some point in our lives, were exposed to the dream that emerged in the mid-19th century of labor growing as a force. For at least 30 years, I think maybe closer to 40 years, the labor movement in the United States has been showing signs of atrophy, members diminishing, successes both in the workplace and in politics also come but much less frequently the ability of workers to organize under legislation passed in the 1930s has diminished and uh, the unions that were the backbone of a strong labor movement, the miners, the steel workers, the automobile workers, the mill workers, the garment workers, all of those unions are shadows of their former selves. And in an almost pitiable way, they try to make up for their loss of labor power by investing themselves in electoral politics. We're going to discuss this terrible situation today, and we have some very fine speakers, and Stanley Aronowitz from the Graduate School of the City University is our first speaker. <laughs> uh, I'm going to make three relatively short and somewhat dogmatic statements because I can't argue from my point of view very extensively in, a fir in 10 minutes. The first statement is this. One of the problems that unions have faced in this country since the 1930s is that after an initial burst of militancy and of independence The unions allowed themselves, for good reason, to become partners with the state. That is not only with the Democratic Party and the government, which in 1935 passed the National Industrial Relations Act, but also with the large corporations with which they dealt. They became, in many ways, part and parcel of the New Deal. The Democratic Party could not have won a single major national election without the support of the unions. But that also entailed a quid pro quo. And that quid was that whenever the Democratic Party veered to the right, even during the Truman administration, the labor movement allowed itself in the first place to become virulently anti-communist, throwing out its most militant section of the labor movement. Secondly, in the Treaty of Detroit of 1950, they became virtual partners in production and identified themselves in many instances, steel and auto specifically, with their own employers. They got a lot out of it. After the failure of the Wagner Murray Dingle Bill of 1949, which was the first post-war attempt at national health insurance, They negotiated pensions in and through the companies. And so now we have employer-based health care. 
which in my opinion is a terrible, terrible thing, as a legacy to try to build any kind of decent health program. That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is that the unions have allowed themselves, and willingly in many cases, that is not true of auto and steel, but was true of a lot of smaller retail, wholesale, and state employees unions, to become virtual insurance companies. The unions have settled down and become not a labor movement, but have become labor insurance companies. They provide benefits. The members look upon them as benefits. That's my second point. My third point is that I want to express deep doubt. There is grave doubt that the unions can transform themselves from within any more than the AFL could transform itself from within in the year of our Lord, 1933, 34, 35. Now, I want to just finish by giving you a small example. I happen to be a member of the Professional Staff Congress of the American Federation of Teachers and of the American Association of University Professors. We have a dual membership. We organized in 2000 a successful rank and file movement. And now we are a union that represents something close to 18,000 people. The union's a good union. But it's a union that is imprisoned, as are all American unions who are victimized by collective bargaining as we know it. It is imprisoned in this set of relationships. Collective bargaining, A, signifies collaboration, and that's very difficult to overcome when you get things out of it. Now we're in a period where collective bargaining signifies retreat, concession, defeat. The problem is not this good or bad leader. The problem we face is fundamentally institutional. We have become a creature not only of law, and the law is a bad law, but we've become a creature of a legislative process. Fran indicated this quite successfully, in which because our defeats at the workplace and organizing and in many other areas have been so extensive, we think we can achieve things through Congress and through state legislatures. I want to state this unequivocally. We cannot achieve much through Congress, if anything. The state legislatures are ready to cut public employees' benefits, and they're already doing it extensively. We have rendered ourselves virtually unable to rise to the occasion. And I end by saying there was one example that should have been a signal that things were in a period of significant decline. 1981, during the air traffic controller strike, the relatively conservative leadership of the AFL-CIO responded to the strike and the fact that Reagan had fired 11,000 air traffic controllers by appealing to the president for clemency. What kind of shit is that? No, 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 but this is serious. What it meant was we are unwilling, unable to create trouble. We are no longer in a position to oppose even a conservative Republican administration by t tactics of disruption, of national campaign, of the kind that would have uh, surely been the property of a union movement, oh, 25, 30 years earlier. We are now only in a position to beg. It may be that the seeds of a new labor movement will take place by a breakaway within the AFL-CIO of some smart, progressive union people like John L. Lewis was, but that the substance of the new unionism will take place largely outside of the AFL-CIO. In fact, that's where I think it's going, and I think we all should welcome it and become part of it. Thank you. Our next speaker is an old comrade of the left forum, Bill Fletcher, a former leader of the AFL-CIO, uh, known for his contributions to Black Commentator, and also co-author of a book, Solidarity Divided, The Crisis in Organized Labor, 
and our path toward social justice. Bill Fletcher, 10 minutes, Bill. Thank you. The challenge that faces organized labor is not mainly structural, but it's conceptual. And that there's a different sort of unionism that needs to be introduced. The challenge for unions is that the basic paradigm that we've been operating under is dead. And I agree to a great extent with what Stanley just said. And that the search for a new New Deal is um, one that will be fruitless. So what can we do? There's basically four areas that I want to uh, make some suggestions. One is that there need to be left reform efforts within the union movement that are proposing a different approach to unionism. I, I think is a related point that I'm suggesting this and suggesting also that there's a profound limitation on staff roles. And uh, as someone who has been and is a staff person, one of the things that one can notice is that particularly in the uh, late 80s and 90s, that many leftists chose to enter into the union movement in staff positions, basically for, for any number of reasons. In one case, in some cases, it was because their bases were destroyed by deindustrialization or the relocation of industry. In other cases, people felt like they could be more effective as staff people. But there is a fundamental limitation of being a staff person. You're not the political leader. You're there at the request and uh, of the uh, political leadership. So we need left reform efforts that advance member control, a focus on social justice and a fight for structural reforms, real international solidarity, and uh, ex organizational experimentation. By organizational experimentation, I mean things ranging from the notion of non-majority unionism, which is very, very important in right-to-work states. That is building up unions that do not have collective bargaining because they haven't been able to reach the 50% plus one uh, threshold, but nevertheless operate as unions. So we need those left reform efforts. The second thing is uh, a building up of community-based labor organizations. The left needs to be fighting for partnerships with forces that are outside of organized labor. So that includes one thing that I think is a real priority right now is the organizing of the unemployed. There needs to be support of worker centers, um, but also informal sector organizing. One of the things that's very interesting around the world is that many labor movements have begun projects. In Zimbabwe, I, I was there several years ago, and the Zimbabwe Congress of Trade Unions was introducing this alliance with these informal economy organizations. And uh, in several other parts of Africa and, and other parts of the world, there's been this interesting and under-publicized effort to build linkages between the formal union movement and the informal economy organizations. A third thing is something we talk about in my book, which is the need for working people's assemblies and a working people's agenda. The basic idea being the, the notion of constructing agendas beginning at the local level that identify like a 10-point program of what it is that working people are looking for and are demanding and assemblies, that is gatherings or congresses to endorse an agenda and to develop the requisite uh, forms of organization. And the fourth area is global solidarity. Organized labor needs to rethink neoliberal globalization. That the, cons that the way that most of organized labor has thought about neoliberal globalization to the extent that it has, has been so-called deindustrialization and trade agreements. What it rarely thinks about is the military side of neoliberal globalization. And that absence of the understanding of the military side and the absence of the idea of the need for the union movement to cr openly criticize U.S. foreign policy has led to um, a, a profound problem, not the least of which has been the inability to build real solidarity with labor movements in other parts of the world. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Our next speaker is James Gray Pope, who is on the faculty of Rutgers University Law School. Uh, Tim. 
today uh, or yesterday, I just happened to notice that apparently economists are predicting that union density in the private sector is going to go down to 2.5 percent. And to me, what it means is that we don't have a lot to lose. We need to consider drastically different approaches. Now, one of the remarkable things about the position of the labor movement today is that the labor movement has absolutely no solution, not even a proposal for dealing with this problem. A year ago, the movement did have a proposal, and it was called the Employee Free Choice Act. I want to say that the Employee Free Choice Act, uh, we should be celebrating its demise. Uh, it was wrongly conceived in uh, just about every way. In contrasting the practice of the American labor movement in the uh, early 20th century with the campaign for EFCA, uh, I want to just mention four different criteria on which they differ. First of all, the time frame in the early 20th century was long term, and I mean relentlessly long term. Labor leaders and activists just kept pounding away. We need the rights to organize and engage in concerted activity. And they came back in Congress after Congress, and everybody knew what people were going to say when they stood up to speak, as irritating as it might have been, and that developed a little force. Second, the model was based on worker practices, not staff practices. Uh, the Employee Free Choice Act was developed by staff members getting together and trying to figure out what's going to make our job easier, not based on worker practices. And uh, the labor laws, uh, certainly the Norris LaGuardia Act, was based on worker practices. It was what are workers doing? Well, they're self organizing and that term went into the statute and they are engaging in concerted activity for mutual aid or protection mutual being the key word mutualism solidarity third the strategy for passing the law the the turf on which the campaign was made was the turf on which we lose money and lobbying the only part of the terrain where we can win is, the, is labor, withholding of labor power. And that's not to belittle labor community coalitions. I, I totally agree that they're crucial and uh, can help in every way. But it's really with the withholding of cooperation, as Francis Piven said way back when, that is the source of power of, of poor people. And then finally, principle. The Employee Free Choice Act is the principle of the act is free choice. And what is free choice? Free choice is a market concept. What you visualize is workers making a free choice. How am I going to get more? Am I going to get more by picking a union and paying dues and having a bargained agreement? Or am I going to get more by remaining on my own, letting others pick the union, and then I can free ride on them? Uh, or uh, certainly that would be the dynamic in the early stages of a union campaign where people have to step out and take risks. Organizing uh, takes place, uh, I believe, through solidarity and uh, people pulling together. It's not about free choice. It's not about rational choice. It's about what kind of person you are and whether you uh, view your solution to your problems as pulling together. So I would say that instead of free choice, we should be arguing for, of course, solidarity at the bottom. But freedom of association, that's the principle that uh, we should be supporting, that the movement of the early 20th century supported, uh, and that principle can be quite powerful. Thank you very much. We'll be right back. You're listening to Making Contact, a production of the National Radio Project. If you'd like more information or for CD copies of this program, please call 800-529-5736. To find out how to support us, download shows, or get our podcasts, go to radioproject.org. So we've heard a lot of talk about the need for workers to organize outside the traditional union structure. The next speaker on the panel has been doing just that. Socket Sony is director of the New Orleans Worker Center for Racial Justice. Worker centers exist precisely because a large number of workers were left out of the New Deal. And today, 
the people who are organized into worker centers are in large part the people we're talking about when we talk about the future of the labor movement. Day laborers who stand on street corners um, looking for work, who have organized into a national federation. Domestic workers who work in households who have organized into a national federation. Um, guest workers, who I'll be talking about a little bit, who are organized into an emerging national alliance. Farm workers and others who have, for the last many years, tried to organize outside of the labor movement very powerfully and in some cases gotten to the point where they can have partnerships with the labor movement to move labor not only to the left really but to move labor to the bottom so that there can be a bottom-up approach to worker organizing again. Um, so I just want to give two or three points of context. Firstly, after Katrina, what we saw was the past 30 years of American history repeated over again in about six months. Uh, it was the United States in microcosm. Very soon after Katrina, a large number of African American workers were displaced and a large number of immigrant workers were brought in to replace them. The African American workers were locked out because of public policy and immigrant workers were brought in. The local workers immediately after Katrina found themselves racially excluded from the reconstruction. Immigrant workers were brought in and found themselves included but racially exploited. And so you had a very stark and clear racial landscape where one group of workers was locked out, another was locked in, and U.S. public policy locked these workers into competition with each other. Six months after Hurricane Katrina, there was still a debate about whether poor people would be allowed to return, but there was no debate about whether affirmative action in contracting would be suspended by the White House, it was, by executive order, and whether the Prevailing Wage Act would be suspended. It was. The Davis-Bacon Act, six months later, was suspended by the White House by executive order. And what it set up then was a labor context in which public policy had created a race to the bottom. And in many ways, we're still dealing with that race to the bottom. A few years later, uh, we have the recession. And with these two events in, in, in backdrop, Two stories of worker organizing are particularly compelling and give instruction, I think, to what can happen when workers really take hold and decide to transform their workplaces and their communities. Soon after Katrina, in a hotel called the Astra Crown Plaza, which was the flagship hotel of a very large and wealthy New Orleans uh, hotel chain, a large number of guest workers appeared from Peru, uh, Bolivia, and the Dominican Republic. This hotel had received multi-million dollar contracts from FEMA to house African American workers who didn't have a place to go. All of these men and women were looking for jobs. Um, at that time that the Astor Crown Plaza was home to these unemployed, poor working class African American families, the Astor Crown Plaza told the Department of Labor that they couldn't find a single U.S. worker willing or able to be a receptionist, a front desk clerk, or a maintenance clerk. So they got recruiters, the Department of Labor of course agreed, they got recruiters to go to these countries and bring back guest workers. We started organizing the guest workers and eventually the workers in the hotels. Guest workers come into the U.S. through the guest worker program on H-2B visas. The visa prohibits you from switching employers and says that if you leave the job, you can be deported within 10 days. In essence, the guest worker program means you do not have the right to quit and you do not have the right to change employers. So we decided to build an organization of guest workers out of the campaign from the Astro Crown Plaza. Six months later, we had a membership organization of guest workers called the Alliance of Guest Workers for Dignity. A few years later, we had a campaign in Tennessee that's equally instructive. At about the same time that the recession was unfolding over Tennessee, a, an employer called Gary Lang decided that he didn't want to hire American workers for his construction jobs and he didn't want to go to the union. So he brought workers who paid $5,000 a piece to labor recruiters and put their homes in collateral against the right to work. He brought them over and after they came to Nashville, told them that it would be another $2,500 in order for them to work. 
in order to, to make it easy for them, he would just deduct it from their paychecks. He then leased them for a profit across military bases and other public projects across seven states. Workers decided to go on strike and we got from the Department of Labor the roster of American workers who had been interviewed for these jobs and who went hired for these jobs. So along with the immigrant workers, with the guest workers, we door knocked all of these American workers and we had one workers' rights board hearing with Jobs with Justice with the unions in the room and clergy in the room about the fact that American workers were being denied these jobs while guest workers were being exploited and all the while this labor recruiter was posing as an employer and defrauding the US government with impunity. Um, the story created a real transformation I believe among the labor leadership in Tennessee which defended the workers strike, joined them in congressional visits and is still continuing to work on the campaign of these workers. I think these two stories are instructive because it shows that when workers organize and are in motion, it has the ability not only to change a dynamic with an employer, but to really take labor leaders through a conversion experience. And when we took in the middle of these, the, the night these workers out of labor camps into FEMA trailer parks where unemployed and displaced African American workers were staying, a lot of times the following conversation would occur. A lot of these immigrant workers would say, you know what? If only we had legal papers, if only we had citizenship, all our problems would be over. And the African American workers said, you know what, we got our legal papers and we got our citizenship and look at how it turned out for us. And so in a sense, a lot of transformative conversations started with the workers really expressing something bigger that they wanted, something more basic than just the right to sit down and have an agreement with an employer. They were expressing the desire to be free. And the African American community, which is also part of our membership, didn't say, you don't have the right to say this is involuntary servitude. Instead, they said, you know what? That reminds us of what's been going on down here for a long time. On that basis, and on the basis of many conversations, we created a theory. And the theory was essentially that the guest worker program, because it does not allow workers to switch employers, because it doesn't give you the right to quit, is a violation of the 13th Amendment. And the U.S. government, in a watershed decision, agreed with us and granted protections to our members based on this intellectual argument. I think, it, I think it is a real example of how three years of organizing and how collaborations between workers, worker centers, unions, and people who have done exemplary research and analysis in academic institutions can really come together to change something that may not have been able to happen, um, you know, three years ago under a different administration. Thank you. That's it for this edition of Making Contact. You've been listening to excerpts from The Future of Labor in the U.S., a panel discussion at the 2010 Left Forum in New York City, featuring Francis Fox Piven, Stanley Aronowitz, Bill Fletcher Jr., James Gray Pope, and Socket Sony. Special thanks to Between the Lines Radio at WPKN in Bridgeport, Connecticut. You can hear the full-length version of this discussion on our website, radioproject.org. That's also where to find our podcast, download past shows, or help make a difference by supporting our work. Thanks for your support, and thanks for listening to Making Contact. This is a political alert from Pacifica Radio Network to you. Help keep KPFA alive with the diverse voices of our community by voting or running as a candidate for KPFA's local station board. Nominations are now open. Please visit PacificaElections2010.org to request a nomination package. For more information, contact Oriana Supportus at LES underscore KPFA at Pacifica.org or call 510 250 2471. 
Remember to renew your membership by donating $25 before June 30th in order to participate as a candidate or voter. Nomination packages must be received before June 30th. 